by now, I suspect you have found Matthew chapter seven. If you have not, do not be embarrassed to go to the front of your Bible and use the, what do you call it? The index, whatever it's, what's it called? <laughs> Table of contents. That's what, I, I don't know why I can't remember that. Yeah, I use it too, uh, because I, nobody taught me the Bible song when I was a kid, so I don't know which book comes after which book. I still have to use that a lot. So don't be embarrassed to do that. But I do encourage you to have a physical copy of God's Word in your hand when we're studying it, studying it together. We, we believe in that so much that we've actually put some right by the double doors as you're walking in because we want you to have one with you. If you forgot one, you can borrow that one, um, those blue Bibles. If you don't own a Bible, you can keep that Bible. That's our gift to you. We want to make sure you have a physical copy of it so you can take notes, so you can familiarize yourself where things are on the page. And, uh, and we want you to be able to go through it as I'm teaching through it so that you can make sure that I'm telling you the truth, all right? Uh, and anybody else, for that matter, that has a microphone stuck in their face, we want to make sure they're telling you the truth, too, so you need to go home and reread the things we've talked about to make sure of that. But just in case you don't have a Bible in your hands this morning, as always, it will be on the Bible in the sky as well. So, I think I should probably reset some framework for the Sermon on the Mount before we go too far. We've been wading out in the weeds a little bit over the last few weeks, just looking at more, some of the more specific things Jesus said. Here's kind of the backdrop to the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus preached this one day, literally on a hillside to a pile of people, uh, most of which were Jewish, but probably not everybody. Uh, some of them were, uh, f they were from all walks of life. Uh, some, some religious leaders were there, some just average blue collar day workers were there. It was just everybody that shows up to Grace Bible on the weekends, th the full gamut of life was sitting there listening to Jesus preach this sermon. I think those of you that have been here through this journey of the Sermon on the Mount together, I think you've seen just how much people don't really change uh, throughout the ages. The same things Jesus was saying 2,000 years ago to them like are still so applicable and right at our front door even now. Um, let me tell you kind of the big point of Jesus' sermon was, was this, to sum it up in one, one word is, um, on your own, you can't please God. That was, that's kind of the point. On your own, you can't please God. Uh, Jesus, throughout this whole sermon, he literally raises the bar to a place that is so high as it comes to the standards of righteousness and what God expects from us. He raises the bar so high that only he can hit it. But that was the point. This was a whole bunch of people that had not yet experienced the death, burial, and resurrection of the Savior of the world. This was a people that Jesus was preparing their heart to recognize that he is God. Uh, this, this was his inaugural introduction to his kingship over us. And he wanted us to see that even on our best day, when we have our best attitude and we're on our best behavior, that we couldn't possibly achieve the standard of God on our own. Only Jesus can do that. He's the only one that can pull this off on his own because he is God in the flesh. So the only way that we can possibly achieve God's standard is through Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus tells us over and over and over again in a variety of different words, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. It's salvation, it's, it's surrendering ourselves back to the God who created us. Surrendering ourselves back to Jesus and saying everything that I have is yours. I am a sinner, you are a savior, and I desperately need you. We come to a place, as Jesus referred to, as being poor in spirit, which means literally acknowledging our own spiritual bankruptcy, that apart from him, we, we spiritually speaking, are nothing, have nothing, don't stand a chance. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount was trying to communicate to us. Now, one of the things that we've had to do when it comes to translating the Sermon on the Mount into 21st century context is recognize that everything Jesus is saying to this audience happened before he died on the cross for our sins and walked out of that grave three days later. So, everything he said to these people was needed to be taken literally by the letter because he had not yet paid the ultimate atonement for our sins. He had not paid the price for our sins yet. He was not yet the savior of the world. He had come 
to become that for us. Now, we are among the blessed generations. We are the ones who were born after Jesus walked out of that grave on what we call Easter weekend, Resurrection Sunday. So we are the ones that get to look back at what he has done for us. And we get to, we don't have to strive on our own to achieve this standard that God has set out before us, but we have to acknowledge that that standard can only reach by God himself in and through us, and we get the opportunity to surrender ourselves to him so that the Spirit of God can live in us, through us, and as us, and accomplish the very things that he has laid before us to accomplish. This is something that he still calls us to that standard, but but he doesn't leave us to our own devices. He doesn't say, okay, you need to come get saved and get you some fire insurance so you don't go to hell. And then uh, you're on your own for the rest of the stuff to start acting Christianly. Christianly wasn't on us. Acting Christianly, the behaviors of our heart that ultimately result in the behaviors of our hands is something that only God is going to be able to accomplish in us. And that comes to us really turning our hearts and our minds towards him. And that scares the heck out of some of you because you've, you've built an empire with your business. You have a certain way of doing life and a certain way of doing things. You're thinking, man, if I give my life to God, like I'm going to have to give all that up or he's going to take this all away from me. Can I, let me just like give you a spoiler alert that maybe like 3% of you, God is gonna say, you know what, you need to give up everything and move to Africa and be a missionary. But I can tell you that's gonna be the easiest decision you've ever made because you will be overwhelmed with motivation of the Holy Spirit to go do that, okay? But for the most of you, surrendering your life to Christ doesn't mean that he's gonna pull the rug out from everything that you are in your life. But I can tell you, he is gonna put fresh lenses on your face and you're gonna start to look at your business and your family and your neighborhood as your mission field. I'm telling you, he, it wasn't a mistake that you live where you live and you work where you work and you have the friends that you have. He figured all this out already. You are a full-time salaried missionary wherever he stuck you. He just wants you to finally put on the right lenses to start seeing things his way. And start seeing that as your mission field. I'm telling you, if you are not in Christ Jesus, achieving God's standard, you are on your own, but his standard doesn't change. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are not alone. Jesus is going to accomplish these things in you, through you, and as you. And he is going to give you the resources. He is going to give you what you need to be exactly who he has called you to be in this life. And it is going to be, it is going to be so beautiful. And it's going to be painful at times and complicated at times, but It is going to be beautiful because it's going to be the most worthwhile life you have ever lived in your life. That was kind of the sermon that I hadn't planned on saying this morning. So hopefully by now, hopefully you get that. If that's all you get this morning, get that. Now we're going to talk about judging people. Some of y'all's favorite topic. Some of y'all just can't help yourselves. Jesus talks about this, the Apostle Paul talks about this, God's Word talks about this a lot. And I can tell you, most of us probably, probably have a bit of a skewed view as to what the Bible teaches about judging. So we're going to take a bit of a broad look at it from what Jesus says, what the Apostle Paul taught about it. And then we're going to zero in on what this means for us and how we can kind of function within the parameters so that we stay within the fairway of what God has called us to do as it pertains to uh, judging and confronting and You get the idea. So let's look at what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, one of the most famous verses in the world. People never cracked open the Bible in their life. They know this one. Judge not that you not be judged. Listen, I'm like, dude, you you don't even know where that is. Look, now you know, okay? Now you know. Next time somebody tries to pull out that red card on you and says, oh, don't judge me. You can't tell me I'm wrong. You say, hey, that's Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. They're going to be shocked because they have no idea. They think it's in the Bible. They have no idea where it comes from. But Jesus says, this is red letters. If you have a red letter edition, that's Jesus talking. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I wonder how many of you this morning, have you ever felt judged before? Or is it just me? Like, I feel judged right now. <laughs> that's for real. And to be honest with you, if y'all are honest with yourself, you know some of y'all are judging me right now. You are. Maybe you're a first-time visitor, you're trying to figure out if you like this church or not. Maybe it's your first time back in a while, you're trying to figure out if you're going to give me another shot or whatever. You're judging me right now, okay? And I don't like you either. I'm judging you. It's going both ways, okay? I'm just playing. I'm just playing. 
Now, we all, we all, man, we all feel judged from time to time. Let me ask you this question. Are you somebody that judges other people? Where's your enthusiasm? You got a judging people problem? Uh, man, we all do. Man, it, it's, like, it's like subconscious. It's so natural, it's subconscious. Like you're sitting in a restaurant and somebody walks in and you're like, you've already kind of like pre-decided things about this person. You've pre-judged them. You're prejudiced to this person already. We, we make judgment constantly. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, there's a lot of things in your life you have to make judgments about and people you have to make judgments about. It may be the nature of your job. You might be a judge for crying out loud and your job is to judge, so I don't know. But I mean, we all have, we all have to do that. We, we do it all the time. And Jesus right here is saying, judge not lest you be judged the same measure at which you judge other people, you will be judged as well. And he goes on to say, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the, what's that word? Log. But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me get a little speck out of your eye when there's a log dangling out of your face. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your eye and then you will be, be able to see clear enough to take the speck out of your brother's eye. That makes good sense, don't it? Do not give the dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs lest they trample them underfoot and turn around to attack you. What in the world is Jesus saying here in this whole section? He just said, don't judge. But then he said, when you are judging, make sure you take the plank out of your eye before you judge somebody else. And then he says, make a judgment as to whether or not people are pigs or dogs as to whether or not you, well, you should waste your time with this at all. What does it mean? Do judge, don't judge. Which one is it? Listen, the, the very type of language that Jesus is using, this circumspective view of judging other people, um, the Apostle Paul also teaches on the same thing, and he kind of does it in the same way. So let's jump over. I'm going to just throw some scriptures at you so we have a backdrop for our conversation, and then we'll dive into like the practical application of what this looks like for you, okay? Let's fast forward or flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. I'm not going to wait for you to get there. I'm just going to read this. You tell me what you hear. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Who's outsiders? Okay, yeah, unbelievers. This is the same terminology Jesus was using when he said, uh, don't cast your pearls before the swine or give that, as, that which is holy to the dogs. That was actually slang words in a Jewish culture of people who were outside the body of faith. They called them dogs or pigs. Kind of messed up, ain't it? Um, I think y'all probably have worse words for people that you don't like. Um, he says, so what, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those who are inside the church or the body of the household of faith, the body of Christ? Is it not those who are inside the church whom you are to judge? And in chapter, or verse 13 goes on to say, God judges those who are outside. All right, let's, so what did we hear from those words right there? That as a, as a Christian, you are not supposed to judge who? Outsiders. Outsiders. But you are supposed to judge who? Insiders, we'll just call them. Yeah, so you're not supposed to cast judgment of people outside of the body of Christ, but we are supposed to cast judgment on people that are inside the body of Christ. We'll talk a little bit more about that and clear that up, but I wanted you to see clearly what the scripture was saying. Now, since we're supposed to judge people inside, what does that look like? Rewind about a few chapters or a few paragraphs back to chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, verse 5. It says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the what? It's God's job. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. The Apostle Paul here in these two verses is saying the exact same thing that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Now, taking a kind of a whole look, taking it in, into account the full account of the Word of God, 
it would seem very clear that Jesus and the Apostle Paul, they're not saying, all right, as a Christian, now that you're a Christian, the Christianly thing to do is just throw up your hands and say, oh, you live and let live. You can't tell nobody that they're wrong. Because I tell you, that's kind of how people treat it. Now I say, well, don't judge me. Oh, you can't judge, you can't judge those people. I think what we just read right here is going to clear up for us exactly what that means, exactly how we need to respond to that, and what our behavior should be as a reflection of what God has said. Let, let me just tell you, um, as a Christian, uh, one of the most valuable things, Jesus called it pearls, one of the most valuable things we can do for one another as, body, as believers in the body of Christ is to judge each other. Now, I ain't talking about being judgmental. Let me pick a softer word because judge is one that kind of stains a little bit. To make assessments. To just observe what's going on in our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in their lives. Man, this is one of the most valuable things we can do for each other. And there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. There's a big difference between making a biblical judgment and handling the confrontation the way God calls us to. There's a big old difference between making a judgment and being judgmental. One is an observation. One is an attitude of the heart. And there's a right way and a wrong way to go about this whole thing. But I can tell you, you know how, you know how valuable it is to me that if, you, that if you ever sit across the table from me at dinner, if we ever go out to eat and you're sitting across the table from me and you notice something in my teeth <laughs> and you don't say something about it and I just happen to get up to go to the bathroom at some point in dinner and I will check my grill when I go to the bathroom, okay? And if there's funk in my mouth and you haven't told me I ain't going to trust you, I don't believe that you love me and I won't hear it any other way because you're going to let me embarrass myself in front of all these other people, but not identifying for me something I couldn't see on my own. One of the most loving things you could do for me is point out that pepper to get stuck, you know, like right there. You ain't listening to nothing I'm saying. You can't even hardly finish your food because you're noticing this thing in my mouth. But you ain't saying nothing. I mean, that's not loving. As silly and as simple as that, y'all feel the same way. Man, we ain't talking about teeth here. We're talking about something a whole lot deeper. Why wouldn't we also value that same love, that same care, that same compassion, that same concern when it comes to something that actually matters like our walk with God? The life that we're living, the attitudes of our heart, the things that we're doing. Why wouldn't we want somebody that loves us enough and cares about us enough to tell us something we don't want to hear? Because it's going to be embarrassing. I'm embarrassed when somebody tells me, man, there's a little, little something, something. Or you got stars in the midnight sky. You got a booger hanging out of your nose or something. <laughs> it's like, thank you for telling me, but I wish you didn't have to tell me kind of moment. You know what I'm saying? Like, man, our walk with God should be the same way. And that's our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to bring that accountability, to, to be an extra set of lenses in their life, to point out potholes, to point out potential pitfalls that are coming, to point out things, man, that are going sideways in their life, man, because we, we long for better for them. But we also know that in their heart of hearts, they long for better for themselves. And we know that God, as Etienne says, man, God has given us a new identity and those slippery things are not who we are anymore, even though we are tempted to do them all the time. But how do we handle this, man? So I can tell you, this is one of the most complicated things this side of heaven. When it comes to being a good brother and sister in Christ, doing a good job as a Christian, this is very complicated because, number one, we don't ever want to come across as judgmental. We don't want to damage a relationship. We don't want to embarrass somebody. Like, we, we just want to make the situation better. We've got so much emotion weaved into that, honestly. More often than not, we either abdicate it completely and we just don't say anything, or we wait till we're so upset that we abuse it and we cause damage because we're doing it out of a place of anger or frustration instead of out of a place of love. And so God's word several times throughout scripture gives us kind of the, 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 the next steps of how to handle this. 
in our lives. I'm going to go to one place in particular just for the sake of our conversation this morning. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul gives us some things to chew on as it pertains to exactly the same thing Jesus is saying, dealing with judgment, getting the plank out of our eye, identifying the speck, weighing out whether it's swine or dogs, how to deal with the whole thing. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he starts out by saying this word, brothers, say brothers. He yet again is qualifying for the people within the household of faith. People that are within, who claim to be a Christian. Let me just clear it up. People who claim to be a Christian. Brothers, if anyone is caught in transgression, that's a fancy word for sin, and that caught could mean two things. Either you got caught red-handed, which that has probably happened to all of us from time to time, or you are caught up in it like a snare. If anyone is caught in transgression, you who are spiritual, another brother and sister in Christ, should restore him in a spirit of, what's that word? Now that's an attitude of the heart right there. To restore them in a spirit of gentleness. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But keep watch over yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burden. So to fulfill the law of Christ, for if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let's start right there. I want to give you some practical next steps as according to these two sections of scripture, Matthew chapter seven, Galatians chapter six, well, and also the first Corinthians passages I shared of how to rightly identify and rightly handle these situations in your life. Because I can tell you, this is part of God's calling on your life as a Christian is to participate in godly accountability with other people. And that's going to require you making judgments and assessments to be able to do that well. So, all right, as we are making assessments, since we're going to pick the candy word, because people get offended in this culture, all right, about everything. As we're making assessments, as we are observing a speck in someone's eye, that we are feeling like we need to do something about, we need to say something, we need to deal with it. As you're making assessment, assessment number one, according to what we have just read here from Jesus and the Apostle Paul, assessment number one is we need to make an assessment of their salvation. Say salvation. Does this person at least claim to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus? I like that Jesus was so clear and so was Paul about making sure about that first, because if you start making assessments and judgments and calling people to account that are outside of the body of faith, you are coming from two totally different places. Your backdrop is not the same. Your beliefs are not the same. Your standards and your moral code is not the same. They don't observe the scriptures as the truth. So like, what are you going to hold them accountable to? It becomes a debate back and forth of what's right for me is right for me and what's right for you is right for you, that moral relativism nonsense. And that's just going to be this round and round opinion debate. So question number, assessment number one is of their salvation. Is this a person that claims to be a Christian? Because if they don't, you really need to pray about how to handle that situation. If they do, let's proceed and take the next step. Assessment number two, now that we've assessed the salvation, recognize this person, okay, they, they do claim to be a Christian. Don't see a lot of evidence in their life, but they do claim it. They say that they are a Christian then we can take the next step in dealing with this issue. Assessment number two, now that we've assessed salvation, we're going to go on to assess the situation. Say situation. situation. We got to assess the situation, all right? Is what I see what I think I am seeing? Let me tell you something. Boy, I do love Christian people, but they love to jump to conclusions. Lord have mercy. All the time getting way ahead of themselves, is what I see, what I think I am seeing. I can tell you that I don't know everything. I don't have all the facts. I won't have all the facts. People only tell you what they want you to hear. They will only let you see what they want you to see. And on your best day, in your most discerning moment, your most discerning moment on your best day, you might, you might be able to properly assess somebody's actions. 
But there is no way, no how on your best day and your most discerning moment on your best day, do you have the capacity to, do you have the calling to, do you have the capability to make a judgment of somebody's heart and their motives? This is territory that God has reserved for himself. Don't believe me? Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 again. It is he that observes and will call out the dark places that are deep within us. It is he that can see the heart. You, can, you might be able to judge actions on your best day, but you will never be able to see the heart. You have no idea, no idea what motivated that person to do that thing. You didn't share their upbringing. You don't know what their conversation with their wife was that morning. You don't know what major loss they're experiencing in their life. You don't know what the background is that is running in their life. You don't know what got them to this point. You have no idea what motivated them to do that action that was so foul to you or around you or whatever. Dare we not make a judgment of something that only God can see, the heart. God made that very clear to us all the way back in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16 when when Samuel the prophet was trying to figure out who the next king was supposed to be. And so so David, David, all of David's brothers were brought out uh, and David had some really big strapping brothers, warriors, powerful, brilliant guys. And uh, they didn't even bring David out to be viewed by the prophet because he's, the, he's like the run of the litter. He was, they just left him in the fields. And so Samuel was looking and he was just speaking to God as he was observing these guys and saying, man, that, that's not it, that's not it, he's not it, he's not it, he's not it. Do you guys have any other brothers? Are there any other guys in your family? Because God has shown me that the king is supposed to come from this family and none of y'all are it. I say, well, we do have little David, I mean, he's just, he's out there with the sheep right now. He said, bring him in. Let me get a look at him. And sure enough, God confirmed in Samuel's heart that that's the one that's going to be the king. Jesus, by the way, came from King David's lineage. That's the one that's going to be the king. And God made very clear through the prophet Samuel to us right there in 1 Samuel 16. Man looks upon the outward appearance, but God judges the heart. Only God can see that. We have no business in that territory. So after you've assessed their salvation, and that's based on do they claim to be a Christian, and you've assessed the situation based on actual evidence that you can see, you can't see their heart, all right? I know, I know we people, the human experience, we like to judge other people by their actions, and we judge ourselves by our intentions. We like to let ourselves off the hook. Man, I didn't really mean it like that. I was just kidding, man, like... We, we like excuse our actions because of our intentions. I didn't mean it. But when we see other people's actions, we assume their intentions. We ain't got no business there. Something only God can see. Only God can see. Make a right assessment of the situation. What is right and what is true. What is measurable. And last but not least, definitely not least, this should actually have been happening all along. As you made the assessment of their salvation, their situation, We need to make an assessment of ourselves. Uh, This one's going to require a lot of work, by the way. A lot more work than most of us put into it. And I'm basing this totally off of Matthew chapter 7 and Galatians chapter 6. We have no problem taking inventory of other people's lives. But God's making very clear, if we're going to step into the realm of investing in somebody else's life or calling them out on a speck in their eye, then you've got some work to do on yourself. You need to take some personal inventory of you. Remember, he just told us right there, he said, how could you possibly remove a speck from your brother's eye while you got a log dangling out of yours? You can't see clear. You can't even get close enough. You got a log sticking out of your eye. So the third thing is we have to take, make a proper assessment, make a judgment of ourselves. So I'm going to kind of give you within this section, within the assessment of ourselves for you note takers, I'm going to give you three things that pertain to Matthew chapter 7 that Jesus says when it comes to alleviating our eye from this log problem. Uh, and then we're going to look at three things the Apostle Paul gives us when it comes to preparing our hearts for making this next step of identifying the speck in our brother's eye and saying, hey, you got a speck in your eye. Let me help you get that out of there. OK, because that is a part of our responsibility as well. So here we go. Here's some questions you need to ask yourself, according to Matthew chapter seven, when you're dealing with your log, you're making your self assessment. Question number one, 
Have I confessed my sin to the Lord? Are y'all confessed up? This is 1 John. It tells us to confess our sins before the Lord. We need to be in a constant state of confessing in our lives because we're probably in a constant state of sinning. Not always loud sins, but sometimes it's the thoughts of our hearts, our attitudes. Let me tell you something. You don't have to ask Jesus for forgiveness. Forgiveness happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. He extends forgiveness already. That already happened. What the scripture tells us to do is to confess our sins before God. In other words, I'm going to acknowledge to you that I know that you know that I have just sinned. Confess our sins before the Lord. Have you confessed your sins before the Lord? Removing log, the log number one. Second thing Jesus talked about, have I sinned against that person? Have you sinned against that person and have you asked them for their forgiveness? Have you sinned against that person and your relationship with them and have you asked them for their forgiveness? I can tell you this, you, you probably have a heightened sense of awareness of the shortcomings of certain people in your life because you have a history with them. And I bet you they have a heightened sense of awareness for the shortcomings in your life because of the history you have with them. I bet you as much as they are hurting and aggravating you, something tells me that you aren't exempt from that conversation because you have probably done something along the way to hurt and aggravate them as well. Have you considered possibly that you have, you spouted off at the mouse last week at your lunch break, you had a, a really poor tone in your voice when you were dealing with them the last time you talked to them or whatever. I don't know how deep that well runs for you, but have you identified some sin, some logs in your eye that that person is going to see clear as day when you point out the speck in theirs? When that conversation, when you go say, hey man, I love you, man, but you're doing this and their, their response is going to be, yeah, but you, you know, you know how that goes. You got logs dangling out of your eye that you haven't confessed to them because you've hurt them and have you sought their forgiveness? In their life, a second question, according to Matthew chapter 7, to think about as you are taking your self-inventory. The second thing, the third thing, you're not going to like this one any more than the other two. Do I have any unaddressed sin in my life? Let me tell you what I like to do with my logs. I don't like to get them out. I try to make them as invisible as possible. I want to do whatever I can do to make sure nobody else sees them. And I'll tell you what happens over time with those sin struggles, those sin habits, those patterns that we have in our life. I can tell you the temptation is real that especially if you've been struggling with it for a long time to just kind of suppress that, to kind of get numb to it. And honestly, you just kind of live your life as if it doesn't exist. And you've kind of redefined that for yourself to say, you know, it's not, I know it's, I know it's a sin, but they're like so much, so much worst things that I could be doing in this world, so it's not that bad, so that's just kind of my thing. God and I have an understanding, that's just kind of my thing. Okay, God doesn't have an understanding with that, just in case you thought that. He's not going to continue to endorse you walking around with a telephone pole hanging out of your eye. Is there any unaddressed sin in your life that you've been ignoring, that nobody's come and talked to you about, because it's a private, it's a silent killer in your life that you just prefer not pay attention to? Have you addressed that and have you brought that before the Lord and acknowledged, God, I have this very secret and very weighty sin in my life that not a whole lot of people know about. And I am burdened for my brother, but quite honestly, this reveals something deeper in me that I need to bring to you because I've got, I've got a real sin issue, a log in your eye, even though it may be invisible. Now let's jump over to Galatians chapter six as Paul really gives us some good instructions on how to take some next steps. Jesus shows us how to deal with that log. I like what Paul says in Galatians to us. I'm going to give you three more things based on verses that we read right there in Galatians. Verse number one of Galatians chapter six, it asked us, are we ready to have this confrontation with that person with an attitude of gentleness? Let me ask you this question. You're thinking about having a conversation with somebody about something that you're bothered with or that you've identified in their life is not right. Let me ask you, is your aggravation your motivation 
or are you motivated by love? Now, don't try to talk your way around that one because it'll be easy to justify your feelings and make it feel like love. Oh, it's my righteous indignation. Yeah, I hear that all the time. No, is your aggravation your motivation? Are you really, are you at a place where you can enter into that conversation with an attitude of gentleness? Look, and I'm telling you, gentleness doesn't mean you slap on the kid gloves like a lot of Christians do. Remember, Jesus said you are the salt of the world. He didn't say you are the sugar of the world. Our job isn't to, when we have to have tough conversations with each other, our job isn't to slap on kid gloves and dance around the subject for an hour and a half until the end of our coffee break or whatever and just lay it on them or whatever. It's, it's not so that we can say so many words that we confuse the heck out of them of why we even came to have this conversation in the first place. Man, some of the most loving things we can do is to be clear and to be firm, but yet come from a gentle, loving heart. Man, do me the favor of not wasting our whole dinner together by dancing around the subject of pepper in my teeth. Just tell me, would you? Do it nicely because my ego is fragile. And get on with it. But with an attitude of gentleness because your care and concern is motivated by a love for me, not by an aggravation with me. Do you have an attitude of gentleness? as you are going in. And, and if, you, if you're not, if your motivation is your aggravation to have a tough conversation with somebody, listen, you are abusing that person. You need to remember that with your spouse. Can you have that hard conversation with an attitude of gentleness? Are you motivated by love? I can tell you, 1 Corinthians 13 tells love is patient, it's kind, it's not self-seeking, and it doesn't revel when others grovel. I mean, your, your end game in this whole conversation is not to get your brother or sister to be so embarrassed or so ashamed of what they did so that you feel better about a thing. And thank God, man, you got, finally got a taste of how I've been feeling lately. No, that's not the point, man. You don't revel when others grovel. That's not love. But you take pleasure in the flowering of truth, 1 Corinthians 13 says. That you are motivated by lovingly sharing the truth with somebody and seeing them get it brings you great joy. Attitude of gentleness. Do you have that when you're going to have that conversation? The second one, mm, tall order right here. Verse 2 of Galatians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, to bear one another's burdens. Did you know that you're on your job description list as a Christ follower and holding one another accountable and investing in that layer of people's life, did you know that your job does not stop at pointing out the fact that, hey, dude, uh, I really love you, and I'm coming to you with a heart full of love and compassion for you, and I, and I struggle with some things too, man, but uh, hey, you got a problem, and good luck, good luck. Now, the next step, approach them with an attitude of gentleness, and you better be dang real, well ready to carry that burden right along with them. I can tell you, don't be so selfish and arrogant enough in your life thinking that you are doing God some kind of favor by calling out, by, by calling out some unrighteousness in a brother in Christ's life and then walking away. And I, oh yeah, I'll be praying for you, man. Right. No, it says, bear one another's burden. If you aren't ready to shoulder that burden of that thing that you're going to call out, you have no business calling it out. How's that for a checkpoint? If you don't want to be a part of that person's resurrection from that particular issue of their life, you have no business saying a word about it to them. Don't even say a peep. You'd be embarrassment to all of us. Don't do it. But if you can approach them with an attitude of gentleness and God has prepared your heart to shoulder that load that they're carrying, because you don't know the depths of it. You, you don't know where that thing was born out of. You don't know how long they've been carrying it. You might have just started noticing it. But if you aren't willing and ready to shoulder that, I can tell you that, that, is, a, that is a litmus test of whether you are motivated by love or not. Or whether or not you are ready to shoulder that burden with them and walk with them in prayer be praying with them, encouraging them, sending them text messages on a regular basis, sharing scripture with them, taking them to that appointment with that counselor, getting them the resources they need to break free from that addiction. Whatever it is, if you aren't willing to get in the game, stay out of the conversation. How about that? 
That's number two. Verse two of Galatians chapter two. Uh, Galatians chapter six. Galatians chapter six, verse three tells us. Let me just read it to you again. I like this. Boy, this messed up right here. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself, period. That's messed up. That's funny right there. Let me ask you this. Have you acknowledged to the Lord, have you acknowledged yourself first, but have you also acknowledged to the Lord that were it not for his grace, you could very well have the same problem. Let me tell you something Christians are notorious for, shooting their own wounded. Why? Because they don't have the same wound. Boy, it is so easy to point fingers at somebody that sins differently than you do, ain't it? It's so easy to get judgmental with somebody that has a different kind of struggle than you have. Because I can tell you, if they struggle with the very thing you struggle with, you'd be overwhelmed with compassion. Because you felt their pain, you've walked that road, you get, you get it. You don't agree with it, but you get it. You know where they're coming from. Have you even acknowledged to yourself and to the Lord of hosts that were it not for his grace, that you could be in the very same situation they're in? And it's by the grace of God that he has given you your right mind. It's by the grace of God that you were raised with a Christian mother or father or both. It's by the grace of God that while you were walking that path of darkness in your life, that God intervened somehow with somebody or something to keep you from taking one step too far where you too would be past the point of no return. It's by the grace of God. That ain't you, you're not a good person. We are naturally prone to wander from everything that is holy. It's by the grace of God, it's through Jesus Christ alone that he could draw us into right being and thinking and doing. But we are sinful to the core until Jesus comes and revamps our mind and our heart and identity. And it's by the grace of God, oh, holy, rolling Christian. And don't, don't be foolish enough to be pointing fingers at somebody that sins differently than you? Have you acknowledged by God or to God that were it not for his grace that you could very well have the same problem? Jesus goes on to say in this sermon, it's so interesting that he takes this direction. I almost feel like he's chasing a rabbit, but he's not. We'll get back to it. And he says this, these famous words. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. Or which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, would give him a stone? Or if, ask, or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? Or you then, if you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And then Jesus transitions into kind of his altar call at the end of his sermon. Now, I have no problem reconciling the whole section on the judging people thing and the golden rule in verse 12 that says treat others the way you want to be treated. Makes perfect sense. But it feels like Jesus is like chasing a rabbit with the whole ask, seek, and knock thing. With this one, I actually had to walk down the hallway this week and knock on Pastor Cameron's door, our resident scholar, and say, how do you reconcile all of this right here? Let me tell you what he told me. Uh, before I do that, let me say this. The sermon within the sermon right there, uh, we could just take those few verses, ask, seek, knock, the goodness of the Father, the sermon of the sermon, within the sermon, is definitely very clear that God is trustworthy, that he is caring, that he loves you more than you could ever ask or imagine, that he has given greater gifts than we could even give ourselves. He, had, he has offered us forgiveness and grace and hope and things that we just don't have access to apart from him. That's the sermon within the sermon. But how does that little section apply to judging people and treating others the way you wanna be treated? Well, it was this, and Pastor Cameron said this. He said, you know what, Dustin? He says, while we are out there taking inventory of ourselves and other people, 
we needed to be reminded right there, right in the middle of the conversation about judging brothers and sisters in Christ. We needed to be reminded right in the middle of that conversation just how high and how deep and how wide God's love and care and compassion for us is. All of a sudden you have to step back from that aggravation situ aggravating situation with that person and just breathe in the fact that God's care and love for you so far exceeds what you could ever deserve. You deserved a rock, but yet he gave you bread. We deserved a serpent, but yet he met our needs and even more so. And that's, a that's a good, good father. And our God is as much a righteous judge as he is a good, good father. And he doesn't want us to make the mistake of thinking that he is exclusively just the judge. And our call as believers to hold one another accountable, to walk with each other in our walk with Christ, to point out potholes and pitfalls that are coming down the pipe in our brother and sister's life, that all needs to be passed through the filter of God's tender, loving mercies for you that are new every morning. God's patience and his kindness and his trueness to you. The fact that he does discipline us because he loves us, but it's never from a heart of aggravation or anger. It's always from a heart of love and with our best interests in mind. And as we are taking those steps of being Christians, little Christ, and participating in that journey with God to love and to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ, we too should have a clear view of God's unrelenting, unlimited love for us. And that should be our driving motivation in serving and loving these others. Let's pray together. Father, I'm pretty sure this is one of the hardest things this side of heaven to grapple with because we've got this very natural side of us that just jumps to conclusions and feels like we're doing the world a favor by speaking our mind and dealing with injustice and But God, we pause for just a second. There, there, there's faces in our mind when we talk about judging other people or seeing a speck in someone's eye, like faces come to mind. It's a very emotional thing for us. And we can see people in our lives that quite frankly need a good old fashioned talking to. And I pray for a second that we could just step back that we could just bask in your glory and just, just feel yet again your tender mercies and your kindness pour out on us and that it would bring us to a place of an attitude of gentleness and prepare our hearts to shoulder the burden with our brother and sister, Lord, and that you would give us great courage and great wisdom as we navigate a very delicate thing and have a hard conversation with somebody that we love to try to call them into right living with the Lord. Lord, I pray that you would go before us and prepare the heart of those people. And quite selfishly, I ask that you would just go ahead and fix the issue so we don't have to say anything. Um, but if part of your love story in our life is calling us to walk in that very awkward vein of obedience, of having a hard conversation with somebody that we love, Lord, I pray that you would go before us and prepare their heart. I pray that you would prepare our heart so that we are motivated not only with love for them, but through the love and compassion and the patience that you have had with us. Lord, I thank you for your love and faithfulness to us. I thank you for your new mercies, your tender love for us, your loving kindness, that Hesed love that is always available to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.